Hello again. This week, tasked with the assignment of finding newspaper articles and headlines that would spice up an American History 2 course, I went to ProQuest Historical Newspapers database and got swept away as I looked further into the news coverage of the Rosenberg trial. For other classes, I have addressed Rosenberg historiography and noted the heated and dialectical battle between historians, writers, journalists, activists, and archivists that has set the tone for the entire historiography of Soviet espionage in America. I picked this topic because it's important for students to recognize that a narrative, a story, history in general doesn't die when the event itself ends. In fact, events hardly end. The Rosenberg trial is an interesting case. There remains to this day a heated debate about what the truth really is, and it's anchored in the confrontational confrontation of ideology and fact. Liberty's biblical worldview principles tell us that a historian must be dedicated to a reasoned and well-investigated reconstruction of primary sources. Newspaper articles are primary sources, and here it's an interesting perspective in which the headlines alone tell an interesting story, paired with images, the articles engage readers, and the timeline of publication proves that the truth is still being stitched together into a tapestry that most closely represents the truth. Most people are somewhat familiar with the, the names, at least, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The best place to start is with the headlines that describe what was going on. The articles themselves add a lot of information. Here, they describe that the two of them were involved in a Soviet espionage ring for atomic secrets. When the Rosenbergs were convicted, they were sentenced to execution in the electric chair. This article from 1953 in The Sun uh, sums up with a somber tone how that that went down. The same article goes on to describe the demonstrations taking place around America and around the world, uh, particularly in New York here, and it also describes the impact on the Rosenbergs' sons, who would later play a huge role in in the controversy over the truthfulness and accuracy and fairness of the Rosenberg trial. Other articles highlighted the political tensions, the, the global and local ones. This is one example discussing the protests around the world. But the media coverage didn't stop on the day of execution. It continued for a long time. There were plays even based on the Rosenberg trials, and one journalist's opinion on that play sparked a good investigative piece in the New York Times in 1970 on whether justice was served or not. In fact, that article said that the principles that guided liberal opponents of the 1953 executions are still valid. It goes on to say that those political tensions don't serve anybody uh, and perhaps do more harm to America than leaking of the atomic secrets. And in 1975, people took to the streets again. This is from the Washington Post. Walter and Miriam Schneer were some of the biggest defenders of the Rosenbergs. And in fact, they launched a whole smear campaign against other academics who didn't agree with them that the, and argued that the Rosenbergs were guilty. It created a huge, huge fight, like a feud, between the Schneers and Ron Radosh. So Ron Radosh took to the Washington Post in 1979 along with Saul Stern describing the research he did for his book which was an answer to the Schneers book. He said we obtained independently all those 200,000 pages of FBI files. They also did interviews and came to the conclusion quote Julius Rosenberg was indeed at the hub of an espionage network but not Ethel. Eventually, Walter and Miriam Schneer would come to the same conclusion in 2009, but not after a hard-fought battle. And you'll see this headline from 2009. 